Tonight, a face-to-face -face confrontation on the subject of nuclear energy. Are nuclear power plants dangerous? Or is nuclear energy the answer to the present power crisis? Does the kind of leakage revealed today at the Pickering plant pose a threat? Or is the so-called danger simply a myth blown out of proportion? On this program, the father of the H-bomb, Dr. Edward Teller, opposes the former editor of Survival Magazine, Dr. Gordon Edwards. From the Yorkville Studio Theater in downtown Toronto on The Great Debate. Resolve that nuclear power plants are necessary and should be constructed. Your chairman, Pierre Burton. Once again, we're in the studio. Let's find out how our audience feels about this. You think the nuclear plants are necessary and should be constructed soon? <clears throat> I'm not an uh, expert on that, but I would think perhaps uh, it would apply more in the eye as regards United States and more nay here in Canada to the fact that we have so many uh, water resources in the north. So you're with Dr. Teller as far as the Americans are concerned, but not necessarily as far as the Canadians are concerned. What do you think, sir? <coughs> well, I think that it's necessary, especially with the um, fuel shortages and that kind of thing, I think it's very necessary to have new stock plants for peaceful purposes. With the fuel shortage, it's necessary. What do you think, madam? Do you think nuclear power plants should be built, or do you agree with Dr. Edwards they should be ab ab abolished, not built at all? Well, I don't know. It, um, I, I mean, I'm here tonight to learn about it. This is the thing. I haven't really got an opinion at this point in time. Well, and that's the purpose of a debate, is to have people make up their minds or change their minds. And that's what we're going to do tonight with Dr. Teller and Dr. Edwards. So we're going to find out exactly where our audience stands at the beginning of the program, and then find out if they have changed their minds as a result of what they hear at the end of the program. So I'm going to ask the audience now to show us where they stand, if they agree that nuclear power plants should be built, then I want them to hold up their cards with the green facing out. If they believe that nuclear power plants should not be built, then hold up your cards with the red side facing out. We will count the cards, let you know what the result is now, and see if any minds have been changed at the end of the program. Cards up, everybody. We'll be back in a moment with the results. The Great Debate, tonight's resolution that nuclear power plants are necessary and should be constructed. And here's your chairman, Pierre Burton. <laughs> For the affirmative, the dean of American nuclear physicists, Dr. Edward Teller, who says nuclear reactors are necessary and should be constructed. And for the negative, the Canadian mathematician, Dr. Gordon Edwards, who says nuclear power plants are dangerous, undesirable, and should be abolished. Your chairman, Pierre Burton. Let me tell you where the audience stands. Dr. Teller, you have oddly enough the hardest job tonight because the audience is with you to start with, 76 to 20. So you only have 20 people whose minds can be changed while Dr. Edwards has 76 on his, uh, against him, who he can change. That's the purpose of the debate. Uh, gentlemen, you know the rules. You each have six minutes. Dr. Teller for the affirmative four, Dr. Edwards for the negative six, including his rebuttal time, and then two more minutes for Dr. Teller for rebuttal. We'll start immediately with a clock for Dr. Edward Teller. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. In Canada. I heard some rumors that I have been introduced in a funny and irrelevant manner. And so I want to introduce myself. I was the chairman of the world's first reactor safeguard committee. That was around 1950. And the committee and myself have urged utmost caution in the building of nuclear reactors. And many of my good friends who wanted to go ahead more rapidly were quite mad at me. I acquired the reputation 
of a mini Neda. I acknowledge that Neda is bigger. I am not quite sure that he is better. Now, I haven't changed my mind. Nuclear reactors should be safe. But something has happened. First of all, nuclear reactors have operated with no industrial reactor, having caused damage to the health of a single individual. A really excellent re record. But something else has happened. The world is facing a critical energy shortage. Inflation in almost all countries is merely the first signal of the storm to come. I believe that the troubles can be as great and may well be uh, even greater than the troubles connected with the Great Depression. That depression brought Hitler on the, to the helm of Germany. It was the introduction to the Second World War. We are dealing with an extremely serious problem. And it is not a problem, the energy shortage, that can be solved in one way. It must be solved in several ways. But nuclear energy is one great component. You in Canada are in a fortunate position because you have plenty of energy sources. You are almost as good as the Arabs. <laughs> we in the United States at present are not quite as fortunate, but we can manage. People in Italy are in great trouble. Well, in England, sort of, uh, in trouble. Dr. We Keller. need this energy. You have uh, more time later on, but it's time for the negative and Dr. Gordon Edwards. Start the clock, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, my honorable opponent, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad uh, to be here tonight to talk to you about a topic which has been of great concern to me ever since I first learned about it about three years ago. And it has to do with the extraordinary dangers associated with nuclear power plants which you will not find in any of the promotional literature that you will read, published by the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited or the United States Atomic Energy Commission. The real issue here, it seems to me, is who should decide. If there is, in fact, danger, who is going to make the decision? Is it going to be made by experts who have convinced themselves that they can solve all the problems, no matter how insurmountable they may seem, or is it going to be made by the citizens who are supposed to take the risks? Now, I would like to just tell you very briefly what those risks are. First of all, it is a fact that every conventional nuclear power plant produces as more radioactive garbage in one year's operation than a thousand Hiroshima bombs. This material is extremely deadly, extremely toxic. Nobody denies this. It's scientific fact. This material, there is no way to neutralize it. It must be stored and guarded for 20,000 years at the very minimum. Some estimates, even from advocates of nuclear power plants, run up to a million years. Now, 20,000 years is four times as long as human civilization has been on the face of the Earth. These radioactive wastes will remain dangerous at least that long. Where are they going to be stored? Well, nobody really knows. The problem hasn't been solved, but the technologists are sure that they can solve this problem sooner or later. That's point number one. 
I might also add, incidentally, that these wastes are so hot they have to be cooled for the first two or three hundred years by artificial means. Point number two has to do with the possibility of accidents, which the people in the nuclear industry don't want to admit is possible. Dr. Edward Teller is perfectly correct in saying that the utmost caution has been used in the building of nuclear power plants. And this is because the people who are engaged in designing these power plants are fully aware of how extremely dangerous they are. In the case of a major accident, which would release, say, 50% of the radioactivity inside this reactor, there could be tens of thousands of people killed and up to $7 billion in property damage, mostly due to radioactive contamination of land, water sources, and food supplies. These figures are taken from an official Atomic Energy Commission report, the Brookhaven report. It is not made up by opponents of nuclear energy. Uh, the accident, or I might say catastrophe potential of a nuclear power plant is so great that no nuclear power plant in the United States or Canada is insured against such loss. In the United States, they have partial insurance, only up to $500 million worth. Almost all of that is borne by the taxpayer because the private insurance companies won't touch it. The insurance companies, the private insurance companies will cover up to the first 90 million, period. At that point, they balk. Now, in 1972, a coalition of 60 citizens groups in the United States challenged the Atomic Energy Commission on the safety of power reactors. And they got dozens and dozens of experts inside the Atomic Energy Commission to testify that they would not stand by the safety of these reactors. There is a critical device called the emergency core cooling system, which is necessary in case there is a sudden loss of cooling fluid. If the cooling fluid goes, the reactor core melts. And according to all expertise, it would melt through anything. In other words, there is no containment, stainless steel, concrete, or anything that will prevent this from melting right down into the ground. It's called the China syndrome, because it seems to head in the general direction of Asia. But when this happens, there is going to be an enormous release of radioactive gases and possible pollution, uh, poisoning of uh, groundwaters, water supplies, and so on. This accident is so horrendous that the people who manufacture and build the nuclear power plants just don't want to admit it as a possibility. Naturally, they take every possible precaution that it's not going to happen. My third point has to do with a rather grim issue, and it's the question of nuclear proliferation, proliferation of nuclear weapons. Because one of the reasons people are interested in nuclear reactors is that they produce material for atom bombs plutonium in particular. The Canadian reactor produces three times as much plutonium approximately as the equivalent American reactor. India, as you probably have read in your newspaper, set off its first atomic bomb explosion in May of this year with materials from a Canadian peaceful reactor. Canada is now trying to sell these reactors in South America and in South Korea. Can you imagine? In other words, they are giving them the wherewithal to produce plutonium to make bombs. Scientists most recently inside the Atomic Energy Commission, including a past Atomic Energy Commission commissioner, Larson, have readily admitted the fact that they are extremely worried of the possibility of some fanatic or criminal or terrorist group stealing plutonium and making a homemade atom bomb. It can easily be done, and Edward Teller himself has quoted, I don't know whether correctly or incorrectly, that there are thousands of people in the United States today who know how to make a homemade atom bomb. It's not a difficult thing to do. So, what I would urge is that uh, I... You get your chance to urge it in a moment, uh, right. Dr. Edwards. We must go back to Dr. Teller for rebuttal. Two minutes for Edward Teller. I agree with almost everything that Dr. Edwards said, and I have said it myself, with one exception. It is an exaggeration to say that wastes have to be cooled for 200 years. They have to be cooled for two years. They are so cooled, and the disposal is extremely safe. Accidents are more dangerous. And that is where indeed we have to make all possible precautions. 
And I have urged and am urging to put nuclear reactors 200 feet underground. And we know from hundreds of underground explosions that nuclear wastes don't travel underground and will not travel to China or anywhere else. Finally, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. A very serious question. Planes have been skyjacked. We are guarding a zillion planes. To guard reactors must be done and can be done. Proliferation has to go on if we want to prevent real shortage in energy. This is what we have to do. And I believe that the only hope is to do something against the causes of war. There will be always destructive weapons. Those weapons, we won't stop. Causes, we can stop if we provide people with what, with the things they need. Thank you, Dr. Teller. We're going to come back in a moment with a face-to-face -face and more informal discussion. You are watching The Great Debate from Toronto's Yorkville Studio Theatre with Dr. Edward Teller taking the affirmative and Dr. Gordon Edwards taking the negative on our resolution that nuclear power plants are necessary and should be constructed. Pierre Burton is our chairman. Just a word or two about our two debaters. Dr. Edward Teller scarcely needs an introduction. He was one of the key scientists who ushered in the atomic age, and he has been in that field almost consistently since then. He is Professor Emeritus at the Berkeley campus of the University of California. He was a one-time advisor to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, and his influence is still considered to be enormous in this field. He's talked about a shortage of energy. He has no shortage of energy himself. Dr. Gordon Edwards, Canadian, his field is mathematics. He's been a university lecturer, assistant director of mathematics study for the Science Council of this country. He edited the first uh, 12 issues of Survival, the international ecology magazine which has subscribers in a dozen countries. He describes himself as a scientifically educated layman on the subject of nuclear power plants. Right now, gentlemen, Dr. Teller, I wonder if we could get a little more detail on the business of radioactive garbage. There seems to be um, an argument here between you on how long it takes to cool it down. Uh, Dr. Edwards has said it's going to be 20,000 years before it ceases to be dangerous. You have said that doesn't matter because it doesn't move underground anyway. How about the 20,000 years? Is that figure accurate? Yes and no. <laughs> Radioactivity, as everybody knows, has a half-life. A radioactive substance loses half its power in a certain period. It loses a, a half of what has remained in the same period, and so on. Now, the radioactive garbage is composed of many substances. The most of the heat is in the short-lived garbage, which disappears within two years. What is likely to do the most damage if it gets loose are two uh, substances. One of them is the famous strontium-90, which live approximately 30 years. To wait, let us say, 300 years until strontium-90 has decayed to one thousandth of its original intensity is reasonable. Some substances, like plutonium, do live 20,000 years, and some a million years. But these are very faintly radioactive, and therefore in themselves not as dangerous. The point is that we have to put them into places where they will not get around, there are several good ways to incorporate them, let us say, into rods, which are not unbreakable, but which will not pulverize if broken, and then put these rods into strong containers. If you break such a container, 
you will have a nuisance, not a catastrophe. If a reactor goes wrong, you do have a catastrophe. And that is why I am trying to differentiate between these two types of danger. I try to be brief. Um, with regard to waste disposal, I would like to point out that uh, plutonium is one of the most dangerous biomedical substances known to man. Over 50% of AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, research dollars is spent on the biomedical effects of plutonium. A tiny amount is enough to cause millions of human lung cancers with almost 100% certainty if distributed in a form where, they can be in, where it can be inhaled. This could happen in a variety of ways. I would like to bring well, out... Just a, a minute. Dr. Teller makes the point that you can put it all in rods, put the rods in containers, presumably bury them, mm -hmm. and uh, in his view, th that makes it safe. Mm -hmm. for the let, next, me, let, uh, me, let me tell you a bit, Pierre, about the, about the history of waste storage in the United States. In 1969, the United States General Accounting Office reported that there were 93 million gallons of high-level waste stored underground in three states. These are in stainless steel and concrete containers which have their own cooling systems and they said that these things would have to be cooled and guarded for more than 600 years. Dr. Teller, do you want to comment on that? They also said that 18 of these tanks have been found to be defective within the last 25 years and some 227,000 gallons of high-level waste have already escaped into the soil. The most famous of these cases are the containers in Hanford where the disposal, the initial disposal, happened in water. Our reactor safeguard committee objected to that before 1950. Our fear was that in a really violent earthquake, there may be a spillage into the Columbia River, which would make the Columbia River not drinkable for a considerable period. I don't know whether it's days or weeks, but it would be a very serious case, although not as serious as the earthquake itself. What has escaped into the ground did escape, but we measured the rate at which it is diffusing through the ground. And it takes several thousand years to diffuse a mile. And the containers are quite a few miles from the Columbia River. What has escaped into the ground is much less dangerous than what has remained. Because that now is not accessible. You can't get at it unless you go there and eat the dirt. Mm. Well, I think the only thing that I'm interested in establishing at this point is the fact that there have been accidents, that things, uh, according to the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, they figure that their waste have to be cored, cooled, may have to be cooled for two to three hundred years. Accordingly, these wastes had to be cooled for a much longer period of time. Uh, I would also mention that every scheme so far proposed that has stood the test of time for more than about, let's say, ten years, has fallen flat on its face for disposal of these wastes. One of the most Outstanding of these was a hundred million dollars and 15 years of research spent in a project called Salt Vault. It was going to be absolutely the answer. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, Alvin Weinberg, who's the director of the Oak Ridge Laboratory, went to the Congressional Committee, which is uh, authorizing funds for these things, and requested 25 million dollars to immediately start storing wastes in the Salt Vault. And he guaranteed that this was the best possible site. Immediately the plan came under attack by Dr. Hamilton, who is director of the Kansas Geological Survey, and by many others. And they said that it is the assumptions they have not made which concern us. I'm quoting. They are talking about canisters which contain the waste, like such as your metal rods. But in a relatively short time, there will be no canisters, because the ceramic matrix and the metal containment will have disintegrated under the influence of radiation. And it's a well-known property of radiation that it embrittles metal, and that in a relatively short time, this metal containment will be gone. Now, what he was afraid of was the fact that there might be water, possible seepage of water into that mine. And if that happened, you would have, even if this happened within a couple of hundred years, you would have a steam buildup, possible explosion, followed by a volcanic geyser of radioactive materials. 
spreading this radioactivity over a very, very wide, uh, hundreds of square miles possibly. I don't know how far it would go when it was airborne. We are discussing details, which cannot be discussed completely here. By good luck, I happen to know about this detail. I would like, I have to say two things about this point. But I hope that we don't spend too much time in these details. One point is this. What my good friend Alvin Weinberg proposed is to store nuclear waste in salt domes where there is geologic evidence that the salt dome had not been disturbed for a million years and where the salt itself guarantees that no water can get to the interior. In principle, this would have been right. Unfortunately, the man in charge of safety at that time in the atomic energy was a man by the name of Milchow, who, for neglecting safety, has been kicked out. Incidentally, after having been de defended by quite a few congressmen, it was not an easy thing to do. And the AEC, under his initiative, tried to put the radioactivity not into a salt dome, which is solid, but into a shallow salt mine in Kansas, which satisfied none of the original conditions. I would urge anybody... Uh, excuse me, please. This was a misapplication of the original idea. And the original idea, I believe, has very real merit if properly executed. Now I want to come to the second point. The danger of radioactivity. A few people. A couple of dozen have been hurt in radioactive accidents, some killed. None of them in functioning reactors, some in experimental devices, including experimental reactors. There have been promulgated safety standards so strict that people now are scared of the amount of radioactivity that we and our ancestors have been receiving for the last few million years. This radiation scare has prevented people from getting proper treatment, have prevented people, even have made people doubtful whether they should get medical x-rays which exceed systematically these standards and I believe that many more lives have been lost to the radiation scare than have been lost to the radiation. I don't deny that mistakes have been made. I don't believe that there is any foolproof method to do anything because the fool is always greater than the proof. But I do believe that we cannot get what we need unless we take some reasonable chances. And what is a reasonable chance must in the end be decided by experts who are not always right, who should be criticized, who are criticized. Many of us, including me, have insisted that all this discussion should be open. 